Good morning, atheists, agnostics, skeptics, whatever you like to call yourself, you are welcome here. At Seattle Atheist Church, we call ourselves an atheist church because you will never hear anything supernatural promoted from the podium. Our church is founded on the principles of scientific naturalism and secular ethics. Truth claims are attempted here, and we stand ready to revise our thinking in light of new information. We attempt to be excellent to all conscious beings, and we believe in good, because good works in non-mysterious ways. If that sounds right to you, then you are probably in the right place. Uh, we meet here every Sunday. The members ourselves give the talks. Um, if you would like to support the church financially, you can do so at clatheist.church, or um, there's a donation jar in the back of the room. So today, after church, we are going to the Burke Museum for the grand reopening. For those of you who don't know, it's really close here by. And on October 27th, we're going to have a pumpkin carving, which uh, we did last year. It was really fun. So uh, details about that are on meetup.com. Come on up. All right. Hey, thank you everyone for coming out today. I appreciate it. It's good seeing you all here. Um, so the title of today's talk is, Is Finland the Happiest Place on Earth? And the answer, uh, yes. Yes, it is. Sorry, Disneyland. Sorry, Mickey Mouse. Um, Finland is, in fact, the happiest place on Earth. There's a, um, there's a list, which I'll be talking about soon. This is according to the uh, 2019 United Nations Half World Happiness Report, which I'll be talking about quite a bit. And this is, in fact, the second year in a row that Finland has topped the list of all 156 countries on the list. So good job, Finland, for doing it twice in a row. Um, just so you know, the top five countries on the list, these are, you know, get your uh, airplane tickets, get ready to move. The top five countries to move to in the world are Finland, Denmark, Norway, Iceland, and the Netherlands. So you might notice that they're all pretty cold. So you know, make sure you pack uh, some warm clothes to wear. Um, they're all Nordic countries, not Scandinavian. I looked it up, they're called Nordic countries. Um, and uh, so those are the best places in the world, the happiest places to live. And I'll explain more about what makes those the happiest places in the world to live in a moment. But just so you know where you should probably not move, um, the, t the bottom five, countries in the world are Rwanda, uh, uh, Tanzania, Afghanistan, Central Africa Republic, and then coming in the very 156, this is the very worst place in the world to live, South Sudan. Uh, so those are places where they're the most unhappiness. What about Mississippi? <laughs> Good question. Yeah, Mississippi isn't quite its own country, but the United States uh, is listed at number 19. We come in at number 19, which isn't horrible, it's not fantastic, but it's not as, you know, not as bad as, I don't know, Sudan. Um, all right, so what are we going to be talking about in this talk? Um, I'm going to be talking about three different subjects. I'm going to start by explaining what this United Nations World Happiness Report is, um, how they're, you know, coming up with this list. Um, then I'm going to talk about exactly what they mean by happiness, because it turns out that's a complicated concept, and there's a lot of different meanings for it, so I want to make sure that I clarify exactly what they mean by happiness and why Finland has so much of it. And then finally, I want to talk about the relevancy of all this to this church, why this matters for what we're doing, because it turns out uh, the report actually talks specifically about organizations like this, so I want to talk about how we're tied into the work that the United Nations is doing. So let me, let me start by uh, explaining what the United Nations World Happiness Report is. So first version of this report was published back in 2012, and that provided all sort of the foundational information for it. It was prompted by, there was a UN resolution that prompted uh, a number of heavyweight academics, including Jeffrey Sachs and uh, Richard Layard. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs uh, is the director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University. Richard Laird is the director of the Wellbeing Program at the London School of Economics. So they were the original sort of editors on the report. So they put together this report in 2012. 
Uh, it's been published almost yearly since then, so every year except for 2014, for some reason, they skipped that year. Uh, but there's been an update on world happiness where they've had contributing chapters every year. Um, so I actually based almost all this talk, I read through the original report and I read through uh, the subsequent reports for the chapters for the years afterwards. Um, so this whole, this whole thing was inspired by the idea, the thing that guided the creation of all these reports, is inspired by the idea that human progress shouldn't be major, measured by uh, just through GDP, through the gross domestic product that there needs to be another measure of human happiness. Um, so instead, what they want to do is they want to use a new index that they call the Gross National Happiness Index, the GNH. So instead of using the GDP to figure out how countries are doing, they want to use the Gross National Happiness Index instead to be able to measure progress. And this idea, I mean, this idea has been floating around for a while, right? It's kind of a utilitarian idea. So it's been floating around, but what really prompted them to start investigating this is the Kingdom of Bhutan. And what happened is the Kingdom of Bhutan, um, they, uh, they decided the King of Bhutan, who ascended the throne back in 1972, declared, this is a quote from the King of Bhutan, gross national happiness is more important than gross domestic product. That was his big announcement in 1972. And then they built it directly within their constitution uh, the, the, as the goal of all of government of Bhutan is the goal of gross national happiness. So it made it a national goal and all government agencies should be pursuing that goal, should drive all policy, all decisions that they're making. Everything should be focused on making the gross national happiness in Bhutan higher. Um, so that was an inspiring thing. Uh, again, it's in their constitution as of July 18th, 2008. Um, and the idea here is a refocus on happiness instead of GDP makes a lot of sense given like Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, right? Everyone's familiar with Maslow, uh, basic idea, there's a pyramid of needs. Uh, first have to take care of sort of like physical survival stuff, like making sure people are fed and they're safe and all that stuff. And once you've eliminated that stage in the pyramid, then you wanna focus on things like, you know, social aspects, making sure that they're happy and they feel valued in the community and they have a sense of belonging. So the idea is that uh, the UN has done, and the world in general, has been doing a fantastic job of sort of solving uh, basic needs things. We, I talked about this quite a bit before when we we're talking about the Enlightenment Now book from Steven Pinker, but just to give you one of, the, one of the statistics they bring up in this report is the reduction of poverty. I don't know if you've been following this or not, but the United Nations has a goal of eliminating all extreme poverty throughout the world by the year 2030. Um, so that's a semi-ambitious goal, but they've been making a huge amount of progress toward it. So uh, just to explain, uh, extreme poverty is living on less than $2.12 a day. Um, and we said between the years of 1990 and 2015, the number of people living in extreme poverty has been reduced by half. So huge impact, uh, you know, huge amount of people happier in the world. So as we get closer and closer to achieving these goals, these really important goals of just making sure that people, everyone in the world feels safe, uh, they have, you know, they're not starving, uh, all the basic necessities are there, it makes sense at this period of human history to start thinking about redirecting our attention onto happiness and happiness defined more broadly so we're not just sort of taking care of basic needs of people so that's the idea. Now, you might argue that, well, isn't there a correlation though between income and happiness, between having money and being happy? So maybe we really sh shouldn't need to refocus on this goal of happiness. Maybe we should just keep focusing on, you know, raising the world's uh, GDP, just making sure people have more money and wouldn't that lead to better happiness? Um, according to the report, and we're quoted, Higher average incomes do not necessarily improve average well-being. The U.S. being a clear case in point, as noted famously by Professor Richard Easterlin, GNP per capita has ri risen by a factor of three since 1960, while measures of average happiness have remained essentially unchanged over the half century. The increased U.S. output has caused massive environmental damage, 
notably through greenhouse gas concentrations and human-induced climate change, without doing much at all to raise the well-being even of Americans. Thus, we don't have a, quote, trade-off between short-term gains to well-being versus long-run cost to the environment. We have a pure loss to the environment without offsetting short-term gains. So just to summarize the point there, um, you know, Americans have all gotten a lot richer, uh, especially since World War II, but all the self-reported happiness surveys shows that we're not happier. So lots more money, not a lot more happiness. That's sort of a bummer. Um, so the report actually discusses the Easterlin Paradox. So he wrote about this uh, back 40 years ago. The Easterlin Paradox is, um, according to surveys, we know that richer people are happier than poorer people. Uh, it's just something, again, people self-report. If you survey them, if you have more money, they're going to be happier. Sorry, um, money can't buy your love. Uh, average, on average. On average, average yeah, sorry. That's fair. Yes, yeah. okay. Yeah, good point. So, uh, yeah, good point. Um, the second part of the paradox is everyone in the United States has become a lot wealthier, especially since World War II. And then finally, the average <laughs> level of happiness has not changed, though, since the 1960s. So that's considered a paradox. There's a lot of different sort of explanations for how that paradox can be solved. One really popular explanation is um, happiness is relative, right? So you only feel happy if you're making more money or you have more money than the people around you. You compare yourself to your own cohort. And so even though the reason that even though we're all getting richer, we're not all feeling happier, is this actually, you know, well, the rich are still feeling happier than the poor. It's just that everyone, if everyone, if everyone's super rich, then no one's going to necessarily feel any happier. Now there's other explanations um, for the paradox. That's just one of them. But what the UN report concludes is these phenomena put a clear limit on the extent to which rich countries can become happier through the simple device of economic growth. In other words, money only buys you so much happiness, right? Um, so that's why the report thinks that we need to do more than just focusing on making sure that everyone in the world has more money. All right, so now we get to the crucial question though. If we're going to focus on happiness, what exactly do we mean by happiness? What does that word mean? Because uh, it's, you know, it's not clear. And here's where things get tricky, because there's multiple definitions of happiness, and there's even multiple definitions of happiness within the United Nations report. It's an evolving concept. Um, but let's start with the definition of happiness from Bhutan, from the kingdom of Bhutan, since that's what's kicked off all of this interest in improving world's happiness. Um, so I'm going to go ahead, and this is a, uh, their definition uh, from Bhutan from the, uh, uh, the, for the Gross National Happiness Index. So I'm going to go ahead and read this. In the GNH Index, unlike certain concepts of happiness in current Western literature, I feel like there's a little sneer there. I'm supposed to read that with a sneer, but um, unlike uh, happy, happiness is itself multidimensional not measured only by measured well-being, and not focused narrowly on happiness that begins and ends with oneself and is concerned for and with oneself. Again, that's a little sneer toward Westerners. Um, the pursuit of happiness is collective, though it can be experienced deeply personally. Different people can be happy in spite of, in spite of their disparate circumstances, but the options for trade-off must be wide. So the basic, the, so they start with this concept that happiness isn't just a single thing. It's not just a sense of well-being. It's multi-dimensional, and in fact, they just go crazy on the multi-dimensional aspect. So this is where things get complicated. The Bhutan Happiness Index uses nine dimensions. Uh, they call them domains to measure happiness, um, and they're all weighted equally. So you have nine different dimensions. I'll just read what they are: um, psychological well-being, health, time use, education cultural diverse, diversity and resilience, good governance, community vitality, ecological diversity and resilience, and living standards. Now I know that's a little fast and it's hard to get a grip on them, but, um, so, but they're pretty intuitive, uh, most of them. Um, for example, time use is broken down into things like how many, how many hours of sleep do you get a night? So, um, for example, if you don't get eight hours of sleep a night, then your index or individual index goes down, and that hurts your happiness rating. Um, some of the indicators, though, are a little less intuitive. Um, for example, there's a values indicator, and it measures people's responses to the question of whether killing, stealing, lying, creating disharmony in relationships 
and sexual misconduct are ever justifiable. And you lose points if you say that killing, stealing, or sexual misconduct is ever justifiable. So if you, if you claim that you're ever justified in killing someone, your happiness score goes down. Uh, so depending on people's answers to this massive survey, and it's decomposed, those nine domains are decomposed, I think, into 124 different questions. So it's a pretty massive survey. They put a ton of resources into doing it. Um, they've divided their population into four groups. There are the deeply happy people, and that constitutes 8.3% of the Bhutanese people. So 8.3% of the people have achieved the maximum level of happiness, and they're in the 8.3% range. And then there are the people who are extensively happy. They're not quite at the level of happiness of the top people, but that describes 32.6% of the population. Not bad. And then there are the people who are narrowly happy. And uh, they, they actually, uh, that's 48.7% of the population, almost half the population are narrowly happy. Uh, narrowly happy. And then finally, the truly unhappy, those people. <sighs> They're 10.4% uh, of the population. 10% are just, you know, unhappy. And the way they've set up this, uh, this index is they've really divided into two groups. They have the happy people and the not yet happy people. That's how they do it. And anyone who's you know, narrowly happy or unhappy are in the not yet happy group. And that's where, you know, they're, they're one of the things they have to decide is how much of the resources do they put into helping the not yet happy versus increasing the happiness level of people who have achieved some form of happiness. All right, so who are these unhappy people? This 10% of the population, what's going on with them? So I thought this was interesting. 69% um, of them are women. So, in general, women are less happy than, than men. 57% uh, uh, are over 40, so you tend to be older. If you're older, you're unhappy. Um, most of them were married. 76% of them were married. Uh, uneducated, so 90% had no formal education at all. Uh, it turns out that zero people who have a diploma or postgraduate degree are unhappy. So as soon as you get that degree, you're, you're automatically out of the uh, unhappy group. And then finally, uh, most of them are farmers. Most of the unhappy people are farmers, 79%. But if you're a monk, you're automatically not in the unhappy group. There's zero monks in the unhappy group. They've all you know, made it up into the happy group. Okay, so this is, you know, again, it's a pretty amazing undertaking that Bhutan did. Uh, UN is using it for a model for everything else that they're doing. One big question that I'm sure you have right now is, you know, how did they come up with all these different indicators? I mean, this is a very complex definition of happiness, right? They have, you know, their nine domains, 32 indicators, and 124 questions. Uh, that's a pretty specific definition of happiness. How did they get there? Well, the short answer is, um, the, uh, it's the majesty of the king, the prime minister and the other ministers uh, figured out uh, norms for their society. And they're explicit, these were norms for their society. Um, they also looked at some statistical properties. They wanted to make sure that they were robust. And they also wanted to make sure that the indicators would work across all sorts of different groups in Bhutan, different occupations, different regions, uh, you know, di uh, different, different groups. And then finally, they wanted to make sure it was simple. Um, I know it doesn't sound simple since there's so many of them, but really they want to make sure that everyone could clearly understand what the things were that led to it. So it's not, it's not, it was uh, created you know, by the king, by committee, by uh, the work of statisticians to come up with this list of different criteria indicators for happiness. All right, so that's Bhutan. Uh, now, the United Nations report talks about other definitions of happiness. Um, the, uh, it looks, for example, at the, the United Kingdom's Office for National Statistics, and there's also question. another... Oh, sorry. Just a quick question about Bhutan. Sure. The the other. So the reason that Bhutan is not among the, the five happiest countries is because they're still poor and moving up? Or? Yeah, they're, they're not bad. I, I forget off the top of my head where they are. They're, not, they're definitely not on the lowest, but they're somewhere in the middle. But I mean, so they're not admired so much because they've attained happiness. They're admired because they've redesigned their whole government where their whole goal of their government is to attain happiness. So they have some pretty, I mean, they, have, they, they, they still have a, 
uh, some issues with you know internal conflicts with government responsiveness. So they, but the the thing that people admire about what they're doing is they're trying to be transparent as possible around it. They've taken it as a goal uh, for you know for the whole country to try to reach happiness. Okay. Yep. Um, all right. So uh, another source of definitions of happiness comes from the United Kingdom. They have an Office of National Statistics, and there's also another group within the United Nations that focuses on coming up with a broad definition of happiness that can be used by all countries in the world. So there's other sources. Um, I just want to simplify this and talk about, there's basically four definitions of happiness that the United Nations looks at. And I want to talk about what those four are uh, because they matter, especially when you want to understand what's going on in Finland. Um, so four definition of, of happiness are more or less defined by these four questions. I'll just throw them out at you. Um, first, let me ask you the question, um, overall, how satisfied are you with your life nowadays? So that's one of the questions. And this question corresponds to what they call an evaluative version of happiness. So it's meant not to be asking you about a specific time, not about your mood right now, but you're supposed to evaluate your whole life and say, you were going to evaluate your whole life, what is your sort of level of happiness? It's also sometimes rephrased in terms of life satisfaction. Um, so it's an overall evaluation of your life question. Question number two. Um, overall, to what extent do you feel the things you do in your life are worthwhile? So that's a little different. And this is the, um, I, I can't really do my Greek, but uh, eudaimonic, how's that sound? That's the eudaimonic Aristotelian type definition of happiness. This is around having a purposeful life or a meaningful life. So it's a little different because it's not just an evaluation of your life, it's seeing your life as having some sort of you know, purpose or meaning is another definition of happiness. Number three, overall, how happy did you feel yesterday? So that's an experiential version of happiness. Um, it's positive affect is how it's referred to in the surveys. So how, you know, what was your, it's for a specific time uh, just yesterday, and it can be you know, influenced by a specific event. You know, you win the lottery, I mean, super happy yesterday. Um, so it's a, uh, so it's, it's considered, again, a positive affect, experiential happiness. And then finally, it's interesting that these two are different, but overall, how anxious did you feel yesterday? Because they, they found out that there's not necessarily a correlation between positive affect and negative affect. So again, it's an affect score. Uh, it's based off of experience, but they track positive versus negative affect. Um, when they do these definitions. So there's four, again, the four definitions of happiness are evaluative, eudaimonic, uh, positive affect, and negative affect are the four that they discuss in the United Nations reports. And they do, uh, the good thing about the 2012 report, uh, Jeffrey Sachs goes into detail um, on this, but they talk about the kahneman Tversky research, they talk about the research in economic theory around you know why they came up with these different definitions of happiness. Um, all right, and uh, the ranking of the 156 different countries where Finland showed up at top, that is using the Gallup World Poll, and that is using the evaluative version of the happiness question. So Finland wins not because you know the Finnish people, when they were being surveyed at that particular moment, felt happy. Um, I don't think that happens a lot with Finnish people, at least according to the stereotype. It is cold in that country. But they, they come up with the highest score because they evaluate their overall life as being happiest um, of all of them. Um, so the Gallup World Poll, here's how it works. Uh, there is, uh, the Gallup, in the Gallup World Poll, uh, there is a sample of a, at least 1,000 people, age 15 or higher, in each of the countries that they poll. And they evaluate the quality of their lives on an 11-point ladder scale from 0 to 10. So that's all they're doing. They do that, and then they have a bunch of questions to determine correlations between their answers to that scale versus other aspects of their life. And uh, the, their, according to the uh, analysis in the 2019 UN report, there's six key factors that explain why um, certain countries have a higher level of happiness than others. So I'm just going to list these out and then I'll talk about what's special about Finland. Uh, GDP per capita, so basically how much wealth each person has. Uh, social support, healthy life expectancy, greater freedom to make life choices, freedom from corruption, 
and differences in generosity. So these are the six key factors. They, uh, they said that you know, this is how you explain the ranking of the different countries. Uh, the biggest difference between the top 10 countries on the list and the bottom 10 was GDP. So that, you know, again, we're talking about on the bottom, people who are just trying to survive, so that's not sur surprising. People starving to death, people in war-torn countries. So it explains uh, the difference between the top countries and the bottom countries. But once you start getting to the top countries, um, the thing that made the biggest difference for Finland was generosity. Turns out that being generous, uh, and the question about generosity, here's the question from the Gallup poll. Have you donated money to a charity in the last month? That was the question. And that was the thing that made the Finns most happy. I just want to remind you, we do have a donation jar. <laughs> <laughs> right, right back there. <laughs> just throwing that in. Um, Send this morning. <laughs> Oh, that's true. Well, yeah, yeah kind of. Well, you know. <laughs> so, um, all right. So the final thing I want to talk. So now we've established sort of you know why Finland is the happiest place on earth. Last thing I want to talk about because I found this really interesting and relevant to um, what we're doing with this church. Uh, they had a chapter that was uh, that was contributed by Richard Laird um, about the nature of happiness and about how. Uh, religion has changed how happiness um, is achieved. And so uh, this, is a, this is an interesting section, so let me just read his introduction. It's in the 2016 report. Richard Laird writes, and again, Richard Laird is the director of the wellness program from the London School of Economics. That's his academic background. He writes, what should be the purpose of our lives and what is the source of our ethical obligations? In the 19th century, most people would have given a broadly similar answer to these questions. Quote, we should live as God commands, and if we do, we shall find our reward in the life hereafter. These beliefs were sustained by frequent attendance at church, mosque, or temple, which provided a combination of uplift, comfort, social support, and in some cases, fear. Since the 19th century, things have changed substantially, especially in the West. Modern science has challenged the belief in a God who intervenes and in a life after death. Though 59% of the world's population still describes themselves as religious, the proportion, the proportion has fallen in most parts of the world, and this trend is likely to continue. He points out, though, that in each decade, Americans believe that their fellow Americans are less moral. So going back to the 1950s, they did a survey, and uh, it's interesting where they asked people how moral and honest they thought their fellow Americans were. And if you go back to the 1952, when the survey was first done, 51% of people thought that their fellow Americans were moral. And that was when people were going to church quite a bit, so in the 1950s. And then uh, over time, though, once we got to 1965, it dropped to only 43%, so only trust 43% of your fellow Americans. By 1976, it had dropped to 33%, and in 1998, we're all the way down to 27%. So you've probably heard about those experiments where they've done things like taking wallets and put money on it and just drop it in the town center and see who will actually return them um, as a measurement of how moral you know, different countries are. So they've done those experiments as well. You know, we're going to hell in a handbasket. I gotta tell you, you know, our morality is plummeting. Um, so that's bad. So he quotes the Dalai Lama. Um, the Dalai Lama says, for all of its benefits in offering moral guidance and meaning in life, religion is no longer adequate as a basis for ethics. Many people no longer follow any religion. In addition, in today's secular and multicultural societies, any religion-based answer to the problem of our neglect of inner values could not be universal and so would be inadequate. We need an approach to ethics that can be equally acceptable to those with a religious faith and those without. We need a secular ethics. So that's the Dalai Lama pushing to come up with a non sort of superstitious, religious based uh, secular ethics. So Richard uh, Laird, uh, as many others have suggested, is that the right thing to do here is to replace traditional religious ethics with a secular ethics based on something he thinks is common to all cultural traditions the greatest happiness principle. So basically, he's pre-utilitarian. Uh, he defines the greatest happiness principle as having uh, consisting of three propositions. Um, proposition number one, we should assess human progress by the extent to which people are enjoying their lives, 
are the prevalence of happiness and conversely the absence of misery. It's proposition one. Proposition two, <laughs> therefore the objective of governments should be to create conditions for the greatest possible happiness and the least possible misery. Misery, As Thomas Jefferson put it, quote, the care of human life and happiness is the only legitimate object of good government. And then number, proposition number three, likewise, the obligation of each of us is to create the greatest amount of human happiness that we can in the world and the least misery. Overall, happiness, of course, includes our own. So those are the three propositions that he believes builds the greatest happiness principle. Um, so he writes, not all readers will agree with the greatest happiness principle, but we can all agree on one thing. In an ever more secular society, we urgently need non-religious organizations which promote ethical living in a way that provides inspiration, uplift, joy, and mutual support through regular meetings of like-minded people. Such organizations should not be anti-religious. They should simply meet a human need for which, for many people, religion cannot be. So Richard Laird, uh, he's actually started an organization he called, uh, uh, he founded named Action for Happiness. Um, and each member of this organization has to make the following pledge, quote, try to create more happiness and less unhappiness in the world around me. So they have to take that basic pledge when they join his organization. And he has the Dalai Lama uh, as a backer of the organization. The Dalai Lama has agreed to be a patron of the organization to support him. So Richard Laird concludes, we live in an increasingly irreligious age, but we have to ensure that it becomes more, and not less, ethical. So the world needs an ethical system that is both convincing and inspiring. In this chapter, we offer the principle of the greatest happiness as one which can inspire and unite people from all ages, from all backgrounds and all cultures, but to sustain people in living good lives, we need more than a principle. We need living organizations in which people meet regularly for uplift and mutual support. To create secular organizations of this type is surely one of the biggest challenges of the 21st century. All right, so let me come to the real conclusion. Uh, conclusion, conclusion. Uh, the goal of the United Nations World Happiness Report is to pro promote happiness over GDP as the most important objective for both countries and individuals. Um, the thing we should all be striving for is happiness. The best life is a happy life, is a happy life, and governments should do everything in their power to make their citizens happier. Um, the United Nations reports even goes so far as to suggest that we should replace traditional religious backed ethics, the ethics taught in churches, mosques, and temples, with a secular ethics based on the greatest happiness principle. I think this is a really interesting idea. Let's discuss. <laughs>